So, be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. So says James, and it seems kind of straightforward, action-oriented. I mean, you know, it kind of has the vibe of the Nike slogan, right? Just do it. Well, this got me thought, thinking, because this is the our first Sunday in the season of creation, about um, all the things that we did in the 1970s, which was kind of the first great era of environmentalism in our culture. But think of all the things that we did in the 70s to save the planet. They're easy to remember because each of them had a great bumper sticker to go with it, right? We took on pollution and, and advocated for and achieved things like the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. So, you know, remember that Keep Tahoe Blue sticker? I remember that. Yeah. Sunnyvale. Well, okay, good. I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> um, we recommend it. We recognize problems like species decline and pass the Endangered Species Act and under, started to understand the role that pesticides played and all that. And we had great bumper stickers like Save the Whales. Okay. We recycled. We composted. I love going to the, the huge recycling center that we had at De Anza College. It was the coolest thing as a kid. So they invented that wonderful little, uh, I, I don't know, infographic, whatever you call it, the little triangle with the three arrows going around saying reduce, reuse, and recycle. We were told to get outside and appreciate nature and, of course, hug a tree, right? Mm -hmm. And then some of you might have even um, fought to um, reduce the use of nuclear power plants with and had your no nukes stickers. Now. A lot of that made a huge difference. I mean, we can see it playing out today. Our air and our waterways are in better shape than they were after the first half of the 20th century. And our species are returning from the brink, and many of them are reestablishing territory. I mean, just this week, I don't know if any of you saw some of the articles about the, the uh, removal of all the dams on the Klamath River, and the, for the first time, that salmon run will be unobstructed, unobstructed. Well, but there's other parts of this that we're looking at and we're like, hmm, I don't know if we did the right thing or not, or maybe it sort of was and sort of wasn't. I mean, we are now coming to understand that it's important to take on board the considerations of environmental justice as well and how um, uh, climate threat affects different communities differently and you know, so for example, recycling, it might help, but sometimes some of that stuff just ended up in landfills in some of the worst off communities or, you know, in China. And how do you know? How do you know? Because we didn't until the newspapers told us. And we're also starting to discover that maybe nuclear power is better in terms of global warming, which is something that we didn't even know about back then. We only just started learning about that, starting, I think, in like the late 80s. And we were completely unaware when I was a kid of all of the environmental <coughs> problems that we have since discovered about using plastics, you know, like microplastics and that we, that's new. Now, wow, we're starting to think that using wood products and paper products might actually be a better solution for us than all of those plastics. So here we are. We're embarking upon the season of creation with this curious set of readings. They're readings that seem to challenge us to do something and to do the right thing. And you know what? Don't just be performative about it. It needs to make a real difference. Only it's not always easy to know, is it? And I don't, I think they understand this in this reading. There's a lot of tension in these readings between what's meaningful and what's just paying lip service to the problem. And there's this basic message, don't be a hypocrite, right? But it's, it's not always clear how that works. And you know what, I, I believe the best of people, just like I know Jesus did. We want to get it right. 
We want to figure this out. But where does that leave us when we can't always be sure which category a particular action fits in? Or, you know, things change, our understanding changes over time. We start to get overwhelmed, don't we, with the complexity of what we are trying to do and the choices we're trying to make, the range of claims about their impact. And you know what? It, it kind of leaves us anxious, paralyzed, or dispirited, maybe even a little bit hopeless about our ability to just do it, to do the right thing. It is no wonder that climate anxiety is a huge thing today. But at the same time, there are things that we hear, these beautiful invitations in that first reading, especially to step into the meaningful engagement with all that abundant and verdant and thriving existence and life that creation has to offer us. I mean, it said, arise, come away, and let the flowers fill you with song, as if it just sort of bubbles out of you when you get out there, especially in the spring. This one, that one's set in the spring. But it's there in the other reasons to, readings, too, because we start to hear things like, feel yourself full of God's generosity and spirit so that you are like the first fruits of the ripening of spring. And I think I hear in Jesus things like, be free. Be free of fastidiousness about what you take in. And I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm with the Pharisees on the like washing of hands and your produce and your dishes, right? Nothing, oh, sorry. There's nothing too terrible about those things, but I think Jesus is saying, don't let that be an end in and of itself. Jesus is inviting people to let goodness and mercy and love flow out of themselves as well. But that's something that's important. So how do we reconcile all of that stuff that's pulling us in different directions? I think the clue might be in our hearts. You see, we, modern people, this is not new to our generation, it's been going on for a couple hundred years, but we like to think that our will to act only lives up here, right? We analyze things, we maybe overthink them sometimes, and then we want to act strategically. And I think I've brought this up a couple times before, but in Jesus's day, they had a different thinking about this. They thought that the will, that thing in human beings that moves us into action actually lives here in our hearts, lives here in our hearts. Now, I know that biologically, neither us nor the people of Jesus' time has much of a leg to stand on one way or the other, because why we do what we do and how we are spurred into action is, in fact, we have discovered incredibly complicated. It's systemic to our entire bodies and also the social um, context that we are embedded in. But from a spiritual perspective, I think that letting both the thinking and the feeling, or the thinking and the feeling, whichever way you want to look at it, in on the act holds some wisdom for us. Because you know what? We don't sit outside of creation as if we're in charge of management and solving all the problems. We're actually, yes, we have stewardship of creation, but we are part of it too. And so we, we're allowed to have ideas about how to fix this mess that we know we've contributed to for the most part, but we're also allowed to have feelings, feelings about all that beauty and the scope of the problems and what we are losing in the process and who is impacted the most. And both of those things feed <coughs> our ability to act. Doing the right thing, it's not just academic, and it's not something that we do in isolation. We're part of families, we're part of intersecting and interlocking communities, 
and we have all sorts of different um, resources and impacts that we're experiencing. This means that, you know, like for example, the people who can't afford electric cars, they happen to also be the people that are most likely to live in areas that are devastated by climate change impacts like storms, drought, and flooding. I mean, we saw that just recently, um, a couple years ago down in Watsonville. So what should they be doing to save the planet? That's a question that we might have asked just with our heads. But we, all of us need to think bigger than just what can I do, what can they do? We need to start to think about all of us. And sometimes that involves talking and sometimes that involves listening. So did any of you know that the letter from James, the one that we heard as our epistle reading and we're gonna hear for a couple weeks running, but that that letter might have been written by Jesus's brother. I, I think I really only just took on board what that could mean because it happens to make it sound less like a Nike ad and more like an intimate look, perhaps more intimate than anyone besides Mary and Joseph at who Jesus was and what he said and did and why. It's got head and heart, I think, or head and heart, whichever way we want to go about it. I get the sense, if I look at it in this light, that James must have loved his brother a lot to stick by his side through everything, because this letter is written long after Jesus has died, uh, perhaps a decade or three. and. Uh, I have this feeling that James could have been watching some of the ways that all these early Christian communities were evolving, and he felt equal parts proud of his brother's legacy, and yet a little bit incensed at the myriad ways that people still weren't getting it, still didn't quite understand all that Jesus has said and what it really meant for their lives. I hear in what he's writing things like, here's what I admired about my brother, because he always brought us back to caring for others in real and tangible ways. And I came to understand over time that that is how we meet God in our midst, by being doers of the word. And yes, that means doing the right thing, but it needs to come from here our will and our compassion, or as we'd say, head and heart, those are both part of it. So where does this leave us on this weekend when we are doing a lot? We're honoring labor and those who fight for justice for the working poor. We are centering our stewardship of creation for the coming month. And we're starting to wonder how we can make a difference. And we're doing all this, let's be honest, in the middle of a pretty contentious election season. I think that we can accept the range of invitations that are coming to us today through all of these scripture readings. We just have to kind of open our minds and our hearts together. We can allow ourselves to have that wonder and joy for creation that we hear being expressed in the Song of Songs. And we can also let all of that righteousness of thought and feeling spur us on to actions. I mean, you know, it's okay if it's a small one, like I have been meaning to get back to carrying around a container in my car so that I don't need to take a one of those plastic clamshells when I finish, you know, have food left over at the restaurant. You know what I mean, right? Like they're yeah. horrible. You can't you can't reuse them at all, etc. If I just carried something around, it would be there for me. That's a little thing, but it actually, you know, it's important. But also I think the invitation is to not dismiss those big things that feel overwhelming to us and aren't just about I or me, but we but to engage in some of the important listening to and working with and understanding the needs of all of the people around us. Because we are not on this planet alone. 
And finally, we can allow ourselves to lament. It's okay to be sad about the ways that we have not gotten there yet. We can acknowledge our failures and our hypocrisies as individuals and a society that keep us all from being the most faithful stewards of creation that we could be. Now, don't let this sink us into despair or paralysis, but instead, I think circle back to that first one. See it as an invitation or a call to continue to place our hope and to invest our hope in God and each other so that we can hear what we're being called to on this front more and more. I want to close today with some verses from one of my favorite poems by Yeats. It, I think, kind of wraps this all up a bit. Um, and it, I, it, it's called out to me when I was listening to that reading from Song of Songs. It kind of echoes it, similar formats. But it allows us to feel the beauty of our created world in our bodies and our souls, almost like it's vibrating with it. It lets us to feel our, allows us to feel our grief and our joy. And then it, I think, is calling us into action. This is from The Stolen Child by W.B. Yeats. Where dips the rocky highland of sleuthwood in the lake? There lies a leafy island <coughs> where flapping herons wake. The drowsy water rats, there we've hid our fairy vats full of berries and of the reddest chosen stolen cherries. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild. With the fairy, hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than we can understand.